Mm -hmm. And, um, but sometimes it's hard because we have lots of different words for the same animals and same plants. Does anybody have other examples of plants or animals that we have lots of names for them? Dogs. Dogs? Dogs? Dogs have lots of names that we call them, right? Mm -hmm. How about, I'm looking forward to in about a month or so, here in Bemidji, we're going to see an insect that lights up at night. What do you call that? Yeah. Yeah, what do you call that insect? Yeah. Firefly. Firefly. Do we have anybody who calls them other things? Another name? Yeah, the lightning bugs. Lightning bugs, right? So it can be complicated to know exactly what you're talking about. And so one of the things that gets complicated too is all of the deer that we have here in North America, right? So if you look back here, the biggest one that we have on the wall back there, can the camera see that over there? Is an American elk. Is that an edge? No. And I don't have, I think this is our moose skull. Um, and the moose, we use the word moose. Where do we get the word when we talk in English? In Minnesota, in North America. How do we get the word moose? What? Probably from the natives. Yeah. Native so the, the Anishinaabe Moan, the Ojibwe word for moose, it is also um, other languages related to Ojibwe, like Algonquin languages that are spoken out on the East Coast, is moose. That's very similar to our word moose, right? Yeah. So, one thing that you can do if you want to be sure you're talking about the same thing, right? In my community, um, like around my family, we always say fireflies. We know what we're talking about, right? And other people might say um, lightning bugs. Or there's a plant we have in my yard. Um, it's just starting to come up. And if I walk past it, I'm wearing shorts, my legs kind of burn. Anybody experienced that before? You touch it, it prickles. What do you call that plant? Nettles or itch weeds. Itch weeds, stinging nettles, itch weed, stinging nettles burning nettles, right? We have lots of different words for that. And one way you can be sure you're talking about the same thing is use scientific names. Um, and there was talking about moose and uh, Swedish moose. Uh, there was a Swedish scientist, Carl Linnaeus. And um, he is, he came, he didn't really invent it, but he really made it into something that is commonly used. In the scientific notation that we use to talk about plants and animals. And what we do is we take two words and we use Latin grammar to talk about them. We call that binomial nomenclature. That means we take two words, we put it together, and sometimes we add a third word <coughs> to indicate the subspecies. So the genus and the species and the subspecies. So in our spelling conventions, um, we use, we usually capitalize the first word, uh, the genus name, and then lowercase, the species name. So, else's, else's is the word for moose. And you can find these in Sweden, in Minnesota, in Finland, in Russia. And the subspecies are a little bit different. Okay, so that's the else's else's. Question. Yeah. Is it else's else's because the genus and species of the, is he you know, the only species of his genus? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or a lot of the that times. That we know about. Yeah. That I know about. Maybe so, there's other ones. A lot of times it'll start out where it'll be a single one is the only one identified, but then they add more later that get added to it. Yeah. So if, at the time it was named, it probably mm -hmm. was the only one. might not be true anymore. It might not be true anymore. <laughs> there might be ones that are you know, no longer, that are extinct now, that um, they've been found too. Okay. All right. Um, where am I? So I would like now for a couple of volunteers to come up. Volunteers with hands. Do you have any volunteers with hands? Come on up. Hands and eyes. And what do you notice about these furs here? You can feel them. You can look at them. Tell me what you see. What do you observe? Um, <clears throat> Are they alike? Are they different? What's something that's alike? Well, one of them, they kind of have the same color thing. 
Uh huh. Yeah. What else? Do they feel the same? No, not at all. No. How, how does this one feel different than this one? This one feels a little bit more rough than the other one. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. This feels a little bit more intense. This feels rougher. Okay. And notice how are their tails? Can the camera see the tails? Maybe not. Let's hold them up. Will you help me hold it up? Ready? What do we notice about the tails? Can you even flip up the white, the, the one on top? Like yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna make I'm gonna make a loud noise and you flip up the white tail. Ready? Okay, ready. Boom! <laughs> ah, so any guess what this what the one on top is? This fur on top. White tail. A white tailed deer, very good. Yes, thank you, volunteer. And anybody else wants to come up? So you guys want to come up and feel the furs and feel how they're different? And you can try, I can say boo, and you can be like a white tailed deer showing his white tail to let other deer know there's something scary out there. You want to come on up? Mm -hmm. And while we're looking at that, while we're talking about that, another thing I want to show about the Headwater Science Center that we have, another thing that you can touch and feel and look at are these prints. So the prints that we're talking about today are the deer family. Thank you. Is it working mm -hmm. on the camera? Yep. So anyone, come on, do you want to help and see? No, no, no. Can you feel shy? these? Yeah, what are these prints? And see, do you want to read really loud what it is? Northern Alabama bison. Oh, the North American bison. bison. The North American bison. Mm -hmm. Another one, do you want to show us one? Yeah, I'll show you this one. Okay, what's that one? Yeah, you can come up here, Jeff. Wolf or yeah, this animal is, is like you think guessing a What what makes so you think that? And wiry, you know? How many tell me tall is can you just turn around so the camera can see? How many tall is can you count? Four. Four? Yes. You can open it and see. What is it? My favorite. A wolf. <laughs> and if you want to see a wolf, uh, when you walk into the Headwater Science Center, we have an Arctic wolf. And uh, I think is the other one a, another kind of wolf? Yeah, it's a, wolf probably. Wolves are another one where the species is super weird because there's a ton of them that are just eastern gray wolves, but there's a million subspecies of it. Yeah. Yeah, what, what is that? Oh, this is one we're talking about, right? This is a North American elk. Very good. And let's look at these really big tracks here. Oh my gosh, there is. Do you want to try that? You want to open it? Feel how big those footprints are. That's the moose. Good job. Good. Do you want to come up and feel the furs too? No? See how much this, how soft this one? Do you want to flip the tail when I say boo? Are you ready? No, nobody wants to do that except me. <laughs> how about you say boo? No? Okay. Boo! Boo! Ich bin klusch ein Elf! Yeah, so the elk, the American elk, we often say, is another species that I just learned today. There's also a, a subspecies that lives in, uh, in Asia, up in the mountains. And the Latin name, the binomial nomenclature, is Cervus elephus. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and when people came here from Europe, they looked at animals and they used the words they already know. So uh, we often use the word elk, which is the German word for moose, right? Um, and other people, French people, when they came um, here, they uh, a lot of them interacted with people who speak Cree. Um, and the Cree word for uh, for an elk is wapiti. And if you look, this one isn't very here to see here. But what color are their backsides, are their rumps? Maybe you can't see here very well on this one, but they're kind of whiter on the back and they're lighter, uh, darker in the front. Um, and so wapiti means a white rump. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So those are our and the Ojibwe word for elk is omashkuz. It's a very different. Word. All right. Any oh, any questions? Let me. Could you? Do you want to be my assistant? Could you go please get the the skull that has the two antlers right there and show it? Please show the camera. Wanna walk right over here? Where well, Ryan is? Perfect. Hold it up to the camera. Yeah, so good this job. is another aren't those good work. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful skull. You can see how the skull is fused together. Do you want to hold up so we can see the, the camera can see the teeth? Yeah, this is a white-tailed deer skull. Beautiful. Alright, do you want to show the rest of the audience too? Any, any other questions or comments about animals, about deer, about names? I noticed some of the water animals have um, first served fur, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking that that's for like water resistance. Yeah, yeah. So another thing that you can do, especially if you come to the Headwater Science Center, is you can check out some of our furs. Um, and I can show you. Two of our animals that have furs that are very good for being in the water. One is the beaver, the castor. Uh, I don't know the sec I don't know the species name. <laughs> That's the French word, which is also the Latin word. Um, but you can see they have guard hairs out here that are very good for keeping the water out. And. Um, would you like to pass this around for the audience to feel too? It's okay. And if for the audience who's here, you can see there's the outside guard hairs, and there's also the inside hairs. That's the beaver. The beaver, and there's actually these inside hairs that were very valuable um, from the fur trade era for making hats out of, for hats out of. So actually people would wear the beaver skins kind of like long underwear in the winter, and the guard hairs would wear off by the summer. <laughs> So yeah, go on and see if you can feel the different kinds of hairs. The ones that keep the water out. Yeah, do you want to, mm -hmm. do you feel that? Yep. Good. And here we have uh, otter. An otter is in the mink, as in the mustela family, the weasel family. Yeah, they're <laughs> Lantra something. There's yeah, I can't, I, can't, I can't remember them either. <laughs> uh, but you can also feel We'll, let, we'll let, uh, let the audience, and come into the Headwater Science Center so you can see and feel and touch and smell and experience science. Mm -hmm. Wanna pass it around, Jeffrey? All right. So and the otter one is really good for feeling the, that undercoat, especially if yep. you go kind of towards the back end rump mm -hmm. side. If you dig a little bit, you'll find a really plush undercoat underneath there. The has it too, if you yeah. dig in there, it's very softly. Mm -hmm. funny. So, and I invite all of you who are, um, who are watching um, to comment and tell us your stories about animal names. <clears throat> and I also want to say that scientists have scientific names for, <clears throat> for plants and animals. So when we communicate with each other, it's clear what we're using. But there are also names that different communities use for animals and plants. And that's okay too. Like here in other Minnesota, there's trees we call poplar trees. And scientists will call them aspen trees. But if you're talking to the people and call them poplar trees, and the people you're talking with understand what you mean, that's okay because names are like a handle, right? When you have a when you have a name and the other person has the same name, you can kind of each uh, exchange from one idea to the other idea. You can each gra grab on to the idea and share it with each other. So I kind of like to think of names as handles. Some people think it's not good just to learn names, but I think it's good to start with a name and then learn about an animal or a plant deeper with more respect. Yeah, any other questions? So I, um, I surveyed the Headwater Science Center staff that I found today of their favorite, oh. their favorite <laughs> scientific names. Um, and mine, I guess, is going to be, well, I have a couple. I think Alice's, Alice's, I like. Ryan um, said his favorite is bison, bison, because it's very clear what it is. And that's also 
good to know that's a bison and not a buffalo, right? So by looking at the scientific names, it helps us know. So there's actually um, there's actually three of them. There's a genus, a species, and a subspecies. So it's bison, bison, bison. Bison, bison, actually. bison. <laughs> it's three of them. Right. So we have binomial not nomenclature, <laughs> but there's also trinomial nomenclature when you have that subspecies there as well. Um, uh, anybody have a guess about Chuck's favorite? Hmm. Which this chuck? is another easy one. <laughs> Um, a very easy one of an animal that we have more than one of here, actually. That's coming up soon. His favorite one is boa constrictor. Okay, this is a scientific name for boa constrictor. I am going to tell you, I am going to tell you, oh, before I tell the last one, why, why, was, why was Latin selected as a language for these names? Why do we use Latin? Most of the scientists were Latin. So, in, in <laughs> well, Europe... Linnaeus is French. Linnaeus <laughs> was Swedish. Was Swedish, yeah. He was Swedish. Um, <laughs> but a lot in Europe, a lot of scientists spoke Latin. Latin was a common language that, uh, that scientists communicated in because they spoke many other languages with their families, their vernacular languages. To become a doctor, you have to learn Latin, too. Right. Mm -hmm. And a pharmacist. So what, yeah, so we have to learn Latin, not just in biology, but also in medicine and law and lots of other fields. And one reason why Latin is useful is because it's not spoken by many people anymore. What happens to languages when people use them? They change. They change, <laughs> right? They change. People, people change words, they change pronunciation, they change ideas. But Latin, people call it a dead language. And so it's not, it's not exactly dead, but there are not many people who speak it. Um, so it's a good choice because it's not going to change. Because it's not spoken by enough people for it to change greatly. So my little joke is, uh, some people say Latin is a dead language, and I say it's just roaming around. All right. <laughs> but I want to talk about one more name question we have here and let introduce you to another I'm new at Headwater Science Center to another new resident here at the Headwater Science Center. I'm gonna oh wait a minute before I do that I was gonna tell you um I'm gonna tell you um James's favorite animal's Latin name. Okay ready? Let's see if you can guess what it is. I almost forgot. <clears throat> Opasaurus Apodus. Opasaurus apodus. Apodus. Apodus means, ah, means there's nothing, right? Yeah. Where do you go if your foot is injured? What kind of doctor do you see? Podiatrist. A podiatrist, right? That's a hint. And if there's ah, it means there's no feet. If opasaurus, we talk about saurus, right? Dinosaurus? What does a dinosaur mean? So Opasaurus apodus. What could what animal could that be? And I almost brought that animal up and I thought, nope. I want you to come down to the Headwater Science Center and check out that animal yourself. The rest of you go after this presentation and look at that animal. We actually have two here. Oh, I heard it. The legless lizard. The legless lizard, yes. The legless lizard. Okay. My next my next quiz is, I'm going to read you a bunch of names, and you try to guess what animal is our new resident here at the Headwater Science Center. So, <clears throat> in Puerto Rico, they say El Blumo. There's also, in Argentina, they say Cuye. Uh, there's Cuyo. In San Salvador, and Guatemala, and Mexico, there's Cobayo, some places. In Spain, they say conejo, the Indias. In, in French, it's a cochon d'ant. Um, in Latin, so the scientific word for this is cavia porcellus. And maybe you can think about porcellus and what that means. Oh, and the German word is Meerschwein or Meerschweinchen. Kavia Purcells, a new resident here. Would you like to see it? Yes. Okay. His name, 
<laughs> Are you shy? He's too shy. He's a little bit shy. Who's going to come out? He kind of matches the deer and the elk too. So any guesses? So if, yeah. Is it some type of bird? Not a kind of bird. This is a type of mammal. Yes. A guinea pig. Yes. A guinea pig. Hello. Hello, Finley. Would you like to come out? So I'll bring Finley up to the camera first. Finley. Okay. There's Finley. And what I think I'll do is I will talk about the Headwater Science Center hours and thank everybody. I'll let when I'm when I'm all done, I'll let you guys pet him and pass him around and we'll bring I'll bring him around individually. I was just going yeah. to say that. I don't think you should let him out for that long because I think that that is just kinda <laughs> Oh, are the owls <laughs> taking interest? <laughs> <I think> <laughs> The yeah, great horned owl is looking me. very intently. <laughs> but I think, I think he's safe. Mm -hmm. Got a comment from our Twitch chat says the Dutch word for guinea pigs is kavia. Kavia, ah! Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Maybe from when Dutch had colonies in South America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that it's more uh, of the Spanish iteration of it than like the German one. Yeah, and I, that, that <laughs> probably doesn't even come from Spanish, but comes from the indigenous languages of South America, yeah. not from Spanish. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put this guy back for just a second. Tell us about the hours. Um, so Headwater Center has new hours. We are open on Mondays, Saturday, Mondays, Fridays, and Saturdays from 9:30 to 5 o'clock for the public. Um, we're also open for just groups on Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So midweek, just groups, long weekends for the public. And we want to, um, you're welcome to call and reserve, see if there's a more space. Space is filling up quickly for groups. And we're just doing this to keep, uh, to keep people safe so we can clean and kind of, um, do a better job of keeping us all healthy during these times. And of course, we're also open today, which is a Sunday from one to five. Sunday. <laughs> Last time I found another L. One to, one to three on Sundays. Thank you. I would look at this and look at this and look at this. One to three on Sundays. One to five on Sundays. One to five. <laughs> yes. One to five on Sundays. Thank you, Ryan. What would I do without you? Okay. And <clears throat> audience, and maybe all of you too, um, afterwards, you're welcome to look on Facebook and uh, like the Headwater Science Center page. And uh, you can watch these presentations any day of the week. Um, and comment, tell us about your favorite scientific names. I encourage you to look up some, read some, uh, read some stories to ask questions. And there's very, lots of interesting things. All right, well, thank you everyone. And if you're here live, you can stick around and, and meet yep. Finley. Thank you. Yeah. And just one last word before we go. Thank you to Belcherme Electric Co-op. They've uh, underwriting some of this for us. So shout outs to them. And we will 